Good evening to you, Willard Shepard here with NBC6 and a proud graduate of the FIU College of Law. And it is fantastic to uh, be with our professors and our president here during the course of uh, this afternoon where we have uh, quite a few developments at NBC. We're uh, proud to be part of this and uh, our service uh, to the community. And we look forward to uh, having a uh, great uh, discussion, uh, sad circumstances though, that, that have brought us all together. But let's uh, try to uh, move our community forward uh, under the leadership of our president that we always try to. So uh, with that, over the next hour, we're going to have a uh, great conversation about this and uh, get input from our community as well. And looking forward to hearing uh, to uh, all the panelists. First, I want to introduce the president, uh, great uh, leadership, uh, first FIU uh, faculty member to become the university of president. Uh, Mark Rosenberg, over 40 years of uh, higher education uh, excellence and leadership, one of the principal ar architects of our university's growth and expansion during the past decade, actually served as the chancellor of the state university system here in Florida, the author, editor, and co-editor of seven books, numerous scholarly articles on Latin America, uh, but beyond that, uh, he is my friend virtually at a distance. And uh, Mr. President, this is normally when I would give you a big hug, but I'll give you a big wave thank you, and sir. smile. Thanks and thank you again for all you're doing on our campus. And thank I will pass the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Willard. Thank you for being with us. We, we so much appreciate your participation and the participation of others here this morning and this afternoon. We've been having discussions. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Willard, a proud FIU law alumnus, as you've mentioned, uh, and for taking time to be with us on this important conversation. So in the last week, the pain, the outrage, the despair that so many of us have felt over the senseless killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Armand Aubrey, and so many others have poured into our streets in the form of protests. But we've had to grapple with many questions uh, in the process, questions about ourselves and our future. Will peaceful advocacy for action overcome violent unrest? Will calls for justice be heeded? Or will we fall short again? Are we truly a nation that embraces differences or will those differences tear us apart? Tear us apart. As a university, we at RFIU, we embrace hope. And we know, we know that this is not a level playing field for all, but we're gonna strive to make it a level playing field we're gonna strive for equity. And we gotta do our part to, to confront racism, especially when that racism results in the deaths and the pain of so many for so long, breaking apart families and extinguishing a bright futures. And we're always gonna be here to listen, and to provide a forum for honest and perhaps very uncomfortable conversations, but conversations that must be had. Our hope is that these conversations are gonna help us to find solutions that, are, that will allow us to move forward together. Forward together, Willard. And that's why, that's why we're here uh, this afternoon. And that's why we've been having so many countless conversations. Our panelists come from the front lines uh, of the struggle. They, they're here to shed light. They're here to help us think things through. They're here to provide their unique perspectives and hopefully offer us solutions. So we look forward to a thoughtful, to a thought provoking, and to a thorough conversation this evening. 
And I want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge and thank all of those who have taken the time to submit questions uh, to us and for your thoughtfulness this evening uh, as we go forward. As president of FIU, I want to assure you that if not tonight, then during a scheduled town hall uh, for Friday at 3 p.m., I commit to addressing your concerns. I hope you'll join us Friday. And now, Willard, thank you so much. Let's get started. Unmute. There we go, uh, Mr. President. Uh, thank you so much again. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the town hall will be on Friday uh, for the university community uh, for us to put our thoughts and uh, brain power together and uh, move forward in a uh, positive uh, direction. And we'll have some more details where our people can make sure they can uh, get in and get online on that. Uh, today's program is an edition of FIU Insights. It's a series that leverages the insight of FIU experts in an effort to better understand the issues of public interest. Uh, please uh, make your questions as brief as possible there. Uh, we've had uh, during uh, the course of the day uh, up to about a thousand people and uh, maybe more now because we've been letting over on our NBC platforms people know about this to be with us. So we have a significant number of uh, people who are joining us, uh, which we love to see. Uh, it's being streamed, excuse me, <coughs> Uh, not only on the FIU platforms, but on the NBC, Facebook, and other social media platforms. And uh, we'll get uh, started with uh, talking to you about the incredible uh, panel that uh, we have with us uh, today. And uh, one of my heroes here, who actually needs no introduction, but for uh, those out there uh, who may be uh, uh, younger than our student president and may not know about his history, H.T. Uh, Smith is the founding director of the Trial Advocacy Program at FIU Law. He's a nationally renowned trial lawyer and a highly sought after trial advocacy lecturer. He blazed uh, pioneering trails here in Miami as the first African American assistant public defender, first African American assistant county attorney. His law firm specializes in criminal defense, civil rights, and personal injury. Smith has successfully represented families whose loved ones were brutally beaten or killed by police officers in various departments in greater Miami. Now, Smith led the successful Boycott Miami campaign, the Quiet Riot for a thousand days in response to local politicians snubbing the iconic Nelson Mandela when he visited Miami back in 1990. President uh, Nelson Mandela wrote that H.T. Smith became well known for his consistent and courageous contributions and support for the struggle against apartheid. We are confident that uh, wherever injustice and racism raises their ugly heads, H.T. will be there to raise his powerful voice of protest and resistance. And we are lucky for him to be in our FIU community and honored. Uh, Carlene Vincent Robinson is a senior instructor and associate chair in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice in the Stephen G. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Her areas of expertise are race and ethnicity, domestic violence, and women and crime. So thank you so much. Uh, Trish Shepard, no relation, is president of the Black Student Unit at FIU and a student majoring in public relations, advertising, and applied communications. You need to come and hang out with us at the TV station. So come on down whenever you want to. Um, Candace Ammons Blanford is an instructor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Her research focuses on the correlation between race firearm violence and police diversity. So we really appreciate your expertise this afternoon. And soon we're gonna have uh, Captain Moss. I have, believe he's gonna be uh, online here. I talked to Delrish about uh, an hour ago. So I know he's over there on the campus. Uh, Delrish grew up uh, here in Overtown, served with the Miami Police Department for more than 30 years before he left in 2016 to serve as police chief in Ferguson, Missouri. We're all aware of the situation that took place there. Chief Moss helped reform the Ferguson Police Department before he retired there in 2018. He's been back at FIU since February of 2019, and we're so lucky to have Delrish back here in South Florida. So with that said, busy time with us. I'll turn to uh, Professor uh, Smith, first of all, uh, because uh, a short time ago, uh, within the last 40 minutes, 
The Minnesota Attorney General has done what many have called for, uh, including uh, the Floyd family to a certain degree, uh, actually uh, charging uh, the officer with second degree murder who had been charged with uh, third degree murder and manslaughter and actually filing charges against the uh, three other officers who were at that scene, basically aiding and abetting. So HT, I will take uh, this to you first to technically explain uh, to our audience out there uh, who don't have your training, uh, the difference between these and the uh, uh, significance of what uh, the Minnesota Attorney General just did. Thank you, Willard. Can you hear me? Yes, hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. First of all, let me thank you for facilitating this conversation. Let me thank the president for authorizing it. And I'm proud to be on with my fellow panelists, all who can provide a very informed and a very uh, focused uh, discussion on issues of importance. So first of all, uh, I am most proud and I agree to be on this a panel uh, because I wanted to talk to the students. Uh, I am so uh, proud of our students, not only here, but around the country. And now we see around the world, 4 billion people know about what happened in the George Floyd case. And it is because of that that I'm confident justice will be done. Today, we saw the correct charges filed against Officer Chauvin, C-H-A-U-V-I-N, the principal uh, person responsible for the sadistic suffocation that murdered George, uh, George Floyd. There are those who want a charge of first degree murder. Uh, that would, in my judgment, uh, could be done, but I don't think that's the most appropriate charge. Uh, first degree murder first call, requires proving beyond a reasonable doubt prior planning, premeditation, intent. Now, in a case, it's possible because Floyd was held down for 10 minutes, pleading for his life, calling for help from his dead mother, saying he could not breathe. And one of the officers said, why don't we turn him over? And Chauvin said, no, that's possible that that could be uh, sufficient basis, but clearly second degree murder is a much more appropriate charge, a charge that has a tremendously high probability of being improved. We do not want to just feel good. We want to have justice, not a sip of justice, a full cup of justice. A full cup of justice is for that officer, starting with him, being convicted and labeled what he is, a murderer, and sentenced to a long term of prison, which will probably require him to spend the rest of his life in prison. As we saw in the videotape, two other officers helped Chauvin hold Mr. Floyd down, one in the back. And a lot of people don't know that compression on the back can also cause the diaphragm uh, to collapse and cause a person not to be able to get their breath. You can cause the death by asphyxiation through back compression. That person, that officer definitely should be charged with aiding and abetting the murder. There was a third officer holding down his thighs and legs, uh, clearly helping Chauvin to perpetuate the murder. You know, this comes from the days of lynching. Uh, what uh, the KKK would do was they would have one guy put the, uh, the black person on a horse. And that's all he did. They would have the next person tie the noose. That's all he did. They would have the next person put the noose around his neck. That's all he did. And then the last person would hit the horse. The horse would run out. The person would hang. Uh, so the, the defense was all I did was make a noose. And so the law then said, wait a minute. Anybody who participates in the crime is likewise guilty. Florida law is so con con conclusive, uh, uh, will it, that if a one person drove another person to a store to commit a robbery and he stayed outside and the person went in and committed a robbery and the police came and killed the robber, the person outside in the car is guilty of murder. 
With regard to the other three people, they aided and abetted. This is the proper charge. I was so proud of the fact that the attorney general, who happens to be black, did not succumb to the pressures, either of the family or of what I call, I'm not gonna say, I was gonna say the mob, of the crowd. You, justice is not responding to the emotion of the moment or the emotion of the crowd. Justice is doing what is right and fair. Right now, the family and those who want justice got a sip from the cup of justice, and now we need a few more sips so we can get a full cup of justice for the family, for many, many other people who have been the victims of police brutality and police deaths. Thank you, Willie. Okay. Uh, Professor Benson, I'll ask you to weigh in on this because this is a, a remarkable development this afternoon and in light of all that we've seen in our streets here in South Florida and across the country, what many have calling for. So please give us your take on what has now happened here in the last 45 minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Willard. Um, thank you first for allowing me to, to be here today and allowing or facilitating this discussion on something that's so tragic um, and allowing us to have an opportunity to discuss some strategies on how we move forward. Um, but be, before I answer your question, I want to take an opportunity to acknowledge the people who have been reaching out to all over the FIU community, all over the state of Florida, um, in terms of all of these people on the panel serving as a voice, a voice for blacks all over the country. And I, and I want to, to stress the idea that we're not okay, we're not fine, we're not okay with what's being done. And to the contrary, we are, we are angry and we are outraged at what has happened over the past week. Uh, people aren't sleeping, we are dealing with heightened levels of anxiety and, and crying out in anguish at what continues to happen to, to black people all over this country. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that we are, are victimized and re-victimized with each viewing of George Floyd's assassination, and, and that's what it was. And also in, in reliving the killing of so many others that have come before because we continue to see ourselves in each and, and every one of them. But in, in terms of the, the question that you asked, I wholeheartedly agree and support HT's assertion that this is what needs to happen. And, and that is, it is a, a sip in the cup of justice as he phrased it. Um, certainly there are going to continue to be questions about the intent of Officer Chauvin and whether or not he intended to kill um, Mr. Floyd from the very beginning. And, and because there may be some concerns about his intent, that's why we move to second or third degree. Um, but I think the, the thing that brings about um, people's, the thing that is going to bring people together is what they've, and what they've been asking for is for the other officers to have been charged. And we are finally getting to see that today. Now, certainly the wheels of justice take a very long time to turn. And we are going to have to stand by and continue to support the Floyd family, continue to support all the individuals who are involved in this and let the wheels of justice turn. Let, let us see what's actually going to, to come out of this case. And if these officers are going to be held to the full extent of the law, which is what we want. Okay. And uh, Professor Blanford as, as well, uh, so many people had called for this. Uh, is this a uh, step toward moving not just with this specific tragedy, but overall in making the change that uh, all of us want. Uh, thank you so much. And I would agree with Professor Smith as well as Professor Vincent in that it is definitely a step in the right direction. A lot of the research that I do kind of looks at police legitimacy and what civilians, um, more specifically, what Blacks really think of police and law legitimacy. And one thing that I found and one thing that the literature supports is that when there are incidents after incidents where nothing happens, then it, it causes people not to view the law as legitimate, you know? And though it may not be everything that we want, right? So, and President Rosenberg spoke to this because when we think in terms of 
George Floyd, the most recent event. Then of course, we think back to all the events that occurred just this year, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. You know, we, we think about Philando Castile and all of these, these tragic events that have happened, those that were caught on social media and those that perhaps happened that did not receive the attention that they needed and that they deserved, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. And for me personally, as someone who has young boys, it, it gives me a sense of hope, you know, because I don't want my, my sons, my husband, my father, my brother, my nephews, I don't want them to become hashtags. And I do think that if people see, hey, there's actually something being done, and if you commit murder, then you're going to pay that price. I do think that that is going, that will help to change things. Okay. And uh, for our student union president, do you feel that uh, there is progress made in the last hour that you and your generation uh, took to the streets, spoke out, and something happened? Does this give you hope? This, um, thank you for having me, um, President Rosenberg and all of our panelists. But this does, um, this does give me hope because I think that you get to see a lot of students my age and the younger generation actually interact and be on the front lines and try to figure out ways to not just advocate, but really push for justice, really push for change. Because um, like um, the professor said, I don't want to see anyone that I'm related to or anyone that I love on as a hashtag. It doesn't, you know, that's not something that I want. That's not something that any family member would want. And so I think as students, as a younger generation, we're now not only educating ourselves, but we're educating those around us who may not be part of the Black community. We're educating those that may not understand why this is so important to us. And so it gives me hope because hopefully students my age are going to law school after this. Hopefully students my age are trying to um, become police officers and law enforcement officers to actually change the system, to actually change what is injustice and what is wrong with, with a lot of the justice system now. Okay, uh, Captain Moss is with us now. So uh, Delris, you and I had spoken about this earlier and uh, Professor Smith went over the technical details of these charges. Uh, does this say to you as a law enforcement officer that, hey, the right thing can happen? Well, it certainly says to me that the right thing can happen. Uh, you know, I, I think there's not one of us who saw that video who was not emotionally impacted by what we saw. And what that does is it, that creates a situation, especially for people like me in law enforcement, where people start peppering us with questions about why this happened and why it's taking so long and all those things. And I've been counseling patients in, in all of this because I know as a former homicide detective uh, that these investigations are slow and methodical because you wanna do them right. Uh, but patience is something uh, that's hard to ask for when people see a video like this when people have seen time and time again cases like this. And so I think this sends a clear message that, you know, the system is working uh, to do the best that it can. It doesn't, it's not always perfect, but there are a lot of good people in the system who are working very hard to make sure that they make the difference that they've been charged to make. And I think this case speaks proof positive to, to that, that, you know, that while it doesn't seem like things are happening fast, fast enough, while it doesn't seem like things are timely enough, they are happening, people are working to make a difference and to bring justice to cases like this. Delrish, I'll stay with you because we're receiving uh, questions from over the thousand people, more than a thousand people that are with us on this today. Uh, and one person asked, what is wrong with police and their training that allowed this kind of behavior to happen in the first place? Uh, we've heard a series of police officers uh, Chief Jeriga, who I've spent time with over the last week, said there's nothing in any manual anywhere that directs this kind of behavior. So how would you answer that question? Well, I answer the question the same way. Uh, you know, I have never seen or heard of uh, someone placing their, their knee on the neck of a human being in order to subdue them. I've been with three, to police, three police departments now, and that just isn't something that, that we see, not to mention the fact that I also sat on the board for the International Association of Chiefs of Police, where we went in and we talked to police chiefs all around the country. And this is not something that, I, I, that I've heard of. 
And so I say to that person, it's not necessarily what's wrong with police, but one of the things that we have to remember in all of this is that police officers are uh, human beings and those human beings come with all the flaws uh, that, are, that, that there are. This is not something that that person was trained to do. Uh, this is something that happened that should not have happened. And, um, you know, it's difficult to say what it, what it is about policing specifically because the vast majority of us do do uh, this job for, for, for good reason. And we do this job well, and we do this job uh, with, you know, to make a positive difference and not with these, these prejudices. But the human element of policing is that we get a bunch of human beings and we put them together and we train them especially, but it doesn't take away the fact that they're human and that sometimes their, their, their biases, their, their uh, aggression, some of these things uh, are just in them. I think it's, if it's not in them, it won't come out. So. Um, I want to ask Professor Smith because uh, he has uh, the longest history with us in this area. Uh, Professor Smith, today I watched Benjamin Crump stand at this site where Mr. Floyd lost his life and he named the list of uh, male and female African Americans who've lost their lives in recent years uh, due to police contact, uh, some of which, uh, some of whom uh, Professor Blanford mentioned. And uh, Ben, who if, we, if you know Benjamin Crump, he never runs out of words, and he ran out of gas trying to name all the names of the people. He ran out of breath, exhausted uh, in his speech. What does that mean? And what does this day mean to you, especially you, that in the last hour we've seen this charge? Well, first of all, everybody must remember that this is a problem of a duration of 401 years. Everybody who does not live in the black community believes that there's more police brutality and police murders going on now. Nothing could be further th from the truth. Will Smith said it best. Racism is not getting worse. Racism is getting filmed so that people who live and work outside our community see what we experience every day and why especially black mothers fear their husbands, their brothers, and their children even going outside to jog, going outside to work, going outside to the playground, because a confrontation with the police officer could cause you your death. When we see month after month, whites like Dylan Roof, who went into a black church in South Carolina, uh, black people there prayed with and for him, fed him, and was so nice to him, he said, admitted, that I almost decided not to kill him. But then I realized, well, there's still the N-word, and so I had to kill him. He had a gun when he was arrested and not a scratch on him. We remember the guy, the student who just recently up in Connecticut shot one guy up with a machete, killed another guy who was a friend of his, had a backpack full of guns and ammunition. He was arrested without a scratch. We saw this month the police trying to detain a white man at the airport, and he was resisting, so they grabbed him. They didn't even hit punch him. And when they grabbed him, he said, y'all treat me like I'm black. So everybody knows that there's a difference in the treatment. And so I want to talk to the young people because you have got to keep the pressure on. When you take the pressure off, then the system will revert like it has done for 401 years. Now, Willett made a good point. Ben Crump lists a lot of people that have been the victims of police killings. But Miami is the only city in the entire country that it has has three major riots in one decade. Only Miami, three, where millions of dollars of damage was done and dozens of people were killed. It was because of that that in 1990 that black lawyers, we led a quiet riot that caused a loss of $100 million in business, tourism business, and it caused the creation 
of a black owned hotel on the Miami beach on the beach. It caused the development of an organization that began to get blacks to own and ownership in hotels. And they now own the 771 hotels. The newest one is about to open in Harlem next to the Apollo Theater any day now. Black Executive Forum, uh, 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 the Inroads Program. It lasted for a thousand days. Right now, it seems like to everybody like, wow, this, 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 this has been going on for nine days. Our boycott lasted 1,000 days. And it's going to take a thousand days or more if you're going to get systemic change. Because what people want to do is tweak. You know, if I gave you an apple and you bit it and you found a worm in it and someone, and I said to you, oh, oh, just wipe the worm out and bite again, you would be crazy to do that. You throw the apple away. That's how bad the system is. So good people like the Delrish Mosses of the community. Boy, if we had all police like Delrish Moss, we would need this conversation. He is a community treasure. I'm so glad he came back. And I hope FIU gives him a contract that he can't refuse so he'll never leave again. <laughs> but one thing he said, I got to kind of twist a little bit because Martin Luther King did it. When they asked Martin Luther King in Birmingham to tell his black people to be patient, he said, never drink from the tranquilizing cup of gradualism. He said, don't tell people to be patient. He said, tell them, let's get to work. Let's make change. And so young people, you can't make the change. I can't make the change. The people who can make the change are political leaders, people who are CEOs of companies, people who are over education, people who are over housing, people who are over banking. But you can have so much creative tension for so long that you create a space that forces them to deal with the problem. And now, <clears throat> in addition to that, young people, you need you now you see for yourself how important it is to register and vote. A lot of my students would tell me, "Oh, uh, I, I'm not going to get in, into uh, <clears throat> politics." Well, politics is going to get into you. So if you want to get into it, you better get into it for self-defense and to be able to make a, a a difference in your life and your circumstances. But please do not let the pressure up. If you let the pressure up. I tell you, this has happened. This is not the first time this has happened. This happens every 20 or 30 years. Go back and check your history. If God asked me today, H.T. Smith, for 15 years, uh, for the 401 years black people have been in America, when, when would you want to be? I would say from 1863, January 1, 1863, to 1877. No other time in American history have blacks been more in control of their destiny than then. And, and, and from 63 to 68, South Carolina, they had the first, the first uh, uh, state to secede. Blacks were free. They had no money. They had no property. They had no education. In five years, blacks in South Carolina took control of their destiny. 120 legislators, 70 of them were black. Mississippi uh, elected its first and only senator. Two, two uh, congressmen from Georgia. Two congressmen from Florida. Why? Because we control our destiny. Even though Barack Obama was president, we didn't control our, we don't control our destiny. We don't control our destiny in the county. We don't control our destiny in the state. And as 13% of the population, we do not control our destiny nationally. White people broke the system. White people got to fix it. And I say to everybody as I close, there are people of our kind who are not of our color. And they have been with us every step of the way where we as a people have made progress. Reach out to our white, Hispanic, Asian friends and we can move together. But we can't do it with talking. We can't say, well, we're gonna stop the, stop the, uh, uh, the, the, the agitation and, and, and just go to the table because if you stop the pressure, you stop the progress. H.T., you uh, so eloquent and touched on uh, so much. Uh, Professor Blanford there was nodding at uh, throughout the course of that. I want to come to her about this. My time over the, uh, outside of my own personal history, of uh, being with uh, the people in the street over the last uh, several days is um, this didn't start in Minneapolis on that corner. 
uh, a week or so ago. This has been uh, something that we've dealt with uh, historically for a long time. Uh, can you address that, especially, uh, and she's a brilliant young lady, our uh, Miss Shepherd, who is with us, but certainly by her age, simply uh, historically, she uh, would not be aware of certain things we've all personally experienced and how the rage that we are seeing in this uh, is, is something that goes well beyond just Mr. Floyd. Thank you, Willard. Yes, I was, the whole time Professor Smith was talking, I'm like, yes, yes, right on, right on. Um, and one of the things that has probably, well, you know what, I don't want to lie. I was not necessarily surprised. Perhaps disappointed would be a better word. At the number of people, people, excuse me, that were outraged by the riots, that were outraged by the looting but were not outright outraged, excuse me, by the actual death of George Floyd, you know? And I was talking to a colleague of mine and, and we shared similar sentiments. And I said, you know, people are looking and they're like, okay, so what's different? What has happened now? You know, and, and what we see, the riots, the looting, right? We should be asking, how, how did we get here? And that didn't start with George Floyd, you know, that, and, and I, as I've watched protests erupt all over the nation and I hear those three powerful words, I can't breathe, you know? And then I think about back to 2014, where Eric Garner said, I can't breathe 11 times. And then you look back a little bit further and you think about Rodney King, right? And you go back, um, a little bit further, well, actually much further. And you think about Emmett Till and it's just, it's, it's a history and people are just, they are tired. This is, this has been something that has existed for centuries. Even if you go back and you think about the foundations of the modern police were founded on slave patrols and you leave slave patrols and you go to black codes and then you leave black codes and you go to Jim Crow. And so the only thing that's happened is instead of people being perhaps overt, they become more covert. But George Floyd definitely represented a tipping point, but this is something that has historically plagued Blacks for centuries. And if no one else is going to say it, I'm going to say it, Black lives matter. My life matters, my children's lives matter. My colleagues' lives matter. And one of the things that is, that I have, um, how do I say this? That I thought was rather remarkable is seeing people, and I know Professor Smith alluded to that it's not just about, you know, black people, but our friends that perhaps may not be able to identify with our struggle, but seeing people in Germany and the Netherlands and Amsterdam and Italy that are saying black lives matter. Because for a lot of people, I think that they're really uncomfortable with the phrase Black Lives Matter. And it's almost as if, though it's not there, they imagine more as if we're saying that Black Lives Matter more. But what we are saying is that Black Lives Matter too. And that we are just as important as anyone else. Not any more important, but certainly not any less important. And I saw a meme and, and I feel like it, it's so succinctly stated or explained Black Lives Matters. And what it said is that we, under, we live in a neighborhood and we understand that every house is important, but right now we need to address the one that's burning. And that's what we need to do. And seeing the, the protests, seeing the young student involvement has given me hope that we are on the right trajectory. And I under, understand that things may not change overnight, but Again, a ray of hope, you know, and Dr. King in one of his less popular speeches, The Other America, and he kind of ends with this statement that I found was so profound, really. And he says that social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. And I think that if we understood, hey, you know, we need to make some serious changes. And as Professor Smith said, 
this isn't anything new. The only thing that's happening now is that people are actually seeing what many of us experience on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not a native of South Florida. I'm originally from Tennessee. And I can remember multiple times being called the N-word. I can remember in middle school being told that, I, that someone was going to run me over and said, get out of the street, N-word. Now, back then, perhaps I didn't, did I have a cell phone? Maybe like a, something, like the, the next cell flip, but I, I didn't have anything with a camera that was as fancy as we have now. But it's not that anything is changing, it's just that now the world is seeing what we've known existed all along. Uh, Professor uh, Vincent Robinson, to that point, let me ask you, do you think we would be here today with all that has transpired, but for the uh, young lady that was standing on the street corner in uh, Minneapolis and did take out her cell phone? Oh, if it wasn't her, it would have been somebody else. Um, the advent of the cell phone is what is really helping us to see that this isn't anything new, just as Candace and HD have said. This has been going on for a very, very long time. This is our history. Uh, and, and what one of my colleagues and I were discussing earlier is the narrative that continues to change. Uh, a week ago, we were talking about um, a, a white woman's ability to, to weaponize her whiteness, right? And the dehumanization of Christian Cooper in Central Park. And we moved to the assassination of George Floyd. And we moved again to, to civil unrest uh, in our nation. And we moved again to, to the looters and the destruction of property. And just as Dr. Blanford has alluded to, there seems to be this message that property is more important than what was happening to George Floyd. The property outweighs or is, is valued much more than the life of a black person in this country. And the fact that we have to continue to repeat this mantra of black lives matter shows me that we have done a very poor job in educating law enforcement. We've done a poor job in educating our police, our, our, our political leaders in that the color of my skin is not a crime. And that just as Dr. Blanford said, black men, women, children, our lives are equal to, not more than equal to the lives of our white counterparts. They are just as valuable as anybody else. So if that young lady had not recorded it, somebody else would have. This, is, this was going to get the nation's attention one way or the other. Uh, Ms. Smith, let me ask you, uh, and I've had this conversation with people who said, uh, certainly uh, those of us who want uh, fairness had the high ground and the Floyd family said no violence. But unfortunately we have seen uh, some of that portrait very, very little here in our community, but uh, in other places. How do we keep the high ground and separate it from uh, some of the things we've seen happen? Who President that, Smith. Who was that, too? that was President Smith. Oh, okay, great. Oh, me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, President Shepard. Excuse me. Oh, it's okay. hard for me to use that word. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you repeat the, the question No, what again? I said was, is that, you know, my conversations with people have been like, hey, look, clearly the Floyd family said no violence, no, none of some of what we've seen. Uh, and I use the terms, uh, the moral high ground here was clearly with those of us who want fairness for everybody when anybody saw that. But yet uh, some allege that that's been deteriorated because of some of the destruction we've seen. And how do we maintain the high ground it, with that having taken place? So I think that um... As, as Professor Blanford said, we're tired. I mean, I'm only 20 years old. My, my, uh, the people that I go to school with are my age, but we've seen our parents have to endure it. We've seen our grandparents endure even more. Um, and so it's not more so taking the high ground, it's more so understanding that this has to change now because I cannot allow my future children to come into a world where they still have to worry after my grandparents have had to worry my great grandparents it's it's our history and unfortunately it doesn't look like it's changing so i think right now the biggest thing that we can do is 
as Professor Smith said, is still apply the pressure, still make sure that they know Black Lives Matter. Once again, not that our lives are any more important, but understanding that they're important right now because they've been neglected for so long. So if we can start to have the conversation towards actionable change, then I think people will be able to see the higher ground and not more so focus on the so-called destruction that's happening. But when you've oppressed people for so long, what do you expect the action to be at this point? They've been, they've been oppressed, they've been suppressed. And so now our time is to make a change. And if that means standing outside for protests, if that means going to, um, you know, writing letters to our elected officials, making calls to those elected officials, organizing all of these things, that's what's going to happen. And I think right now, once again, George Floyd, as tragic as it was, was the straw that broke the camel's back. And now we're saying no more. Captain Moss, uh, you walk basically uh, in two worlds. Uh, I grew up in a neighborhood in a city uh, like you. My dad was Alberto Carvalho, where we grew up, and he believed being close to his work. So uh, we were surrounded by people of all uh, backgrounds and uh, some who have spent a significant part of their life incarcerated. Uh, but, you know, my father and uh, those of us try to walk in uh, those areas and have conversations with them to be able to deescalate things, not make it worse. Uh, because of uh, who you are, how do you balance that and have a conversation with individuals and train other officers to say, hey, look, you know what? It's probably better to have a conversation that guy with that guy than a confrontation. And I'm sure that's happened to you uh, hundreds of times. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that happens all the time is uh, I get into conversation with friends uh, who are not police officers and we talk about that. And then I get into conversations with friends who are uh, not black and uh, who are police officers, and we have conversations about that. And, and, and I bring that up because it, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I walk two worlds. I'm black and I'm blue. And um, sometimes, even within policing, we are, we grapple with that conversation. We have that conversation. Um, you know, before I became a police officer, one of the reasons I became a police officer is because of two negative experiences with police officers. In one case, I was stopped by a police officer for just simply sitting there and he called me the N-word, rifled through my, my bag. I was a 15 year old kid and told me that, you know, you N-word don't walk downtown after dark. Uh, about a year later, I had a similar experience where I was pushed up against the wall, frisked, uh, uh, degraded, and uh, the police officer left as, as quickly as he came without doing anything to restore my dignity. So I understand that in fact, those were the things that made me decide to become a police officer. And so, you know, one of the things that we talk about in all of this is participation. And I say this to young people, uh, participation is critically important. I decided to become a police officer because I wanted to make a difference uh, in my community by providing service that I didn't think we were getting. And that's what made me uh, do this. Um, and part of that was bringing to police work the experience of my other world so that they understood and could better uh, relate to my community and, you know, in, in part to be the watchdog as well for uh, those who were policing my community. Being a member of the community and being a police officer provided a unique perspective that I had to bring to the table in order to make sure things, that, things were happening right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I talk about that in large part because that also provided me with the opportunity when I saw police officers stepping across the line and doing other things that provided me with the opportunity to be there, stop them, and, 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 and report that. And so when I went to Ferguson, I took that into consideration when I created a policy that talked about making police officers responsible for not just sitting on the sidelines when they see something happens, uh, making them just as responsible for those actions when they don't uh, step up. Um, because you, you do navigate two worlds. Now, one of the things I also say is that we'll never change everyone's heart. Racism will always exist. And yes, sometimes that racism will walk in blue. Uh, but one of the things we can do through participation and through making sure that we're holding people accountable is make, uh, make people do the job the way they're supposed to do it and weed out those who are not supposed, uh, are not supposed to be wearing that badge. Uh, Ferguson is a prime example of that. When I got to Ferguson, they thought I was an alien. 
because I was a black man in charge of a police department and they had not seen that. And in 2014, we all saw what happened there. But just a few years later, because of heavy participation and continued, continued pressure from a, an active and involved community, Ferguson last night uh, elected its first African-American and first female mayor. Uh, uh, Ella Jones, I was on the phone with her last night for an hour and a half uh, after uh, she, was, she was elected. And uh, I say all that to say that a lot of things change in a city uh, where there wasn't participation, especially in the African-American community prior to. Uh, Ferguson was a 70% African-American community with no black representation on the city council, no black representation on the school board, no black representation in policing. I, I, in fact, I promoted the first uh, sergeant who's a female and I promoted the first um, uh, lieutenant who just got promoted to captain uh, subsequently because of the outstanding work that he does. And so those things didn't happen because Delrich Moss went in and was able to major, wave, uh, wave a magic wand. Those things happened because people were intentional, participating in government, participating in making sure that government is held accountable, participating in making sure that the police department was even held accountable. Okay, uh, Dr. Vincent, I'm receiving a uh, question uh, about uh, some of your comments and, and, and directing this uh, to, to you first and others to uh, weigh in. For uh, people that are of other genetics, how do we get them to comprehend the shoes that uh, we walk in. Uh, Dr. S or, or Professor Smith would say walk in privity with us. How does that happen? Um, certainly, I think that we need to share our stories and our experiences. And we can no longer keep them to ourselves. We need to share our history. We need to know all of our history. We need to share the feelings that we've all had and um, acknowledge that there is a, a fear that black people have in, in dealing with law enforcement, in, in um, dealing with uh, the criminal justice system overall and, and no, longer, no longer bury that. I mean, as has been alluded to before, there's a history of injustice in this country and there seems to be a group of people who are willing to deny that any of this has ever happened. And we're not in a position to deny that it's happened. Uh, whether it was the slave patrols or the racial segregation or the war against drugs or the stop and frisk policies that seemingly affect um, people of color more than whites um, or what we're seeing now with the arrest and the use of tear gas or, or rubber bullets against nonviolent protesters, even racial profiling, the systematic harassment, if you will, against people of color we have to share those experiences and we have to fight against them. We have to join each other. Everyone needs to come together. Everyone needs to be allies um, and with this because not all of us possess the power or the influence to bring about the change. We have the power and the influence just to share the voice, to share the story, and we may rely on others to help bring about the change. H.T., can you weigh in on that? I have uh, people asking me, and you know, we run across people every day of all different backgrounds of don't comprehend, I'm going to use the words, uh, don't get it uh, about this and are watching it on television but have had no experience with it. Uh, and how do you get them to understand that because they may be in a position to make something happen? Well, one of the reasons I'm so hopeful is that the artist's generation is not having this foolishness that my generation had, either being willfully blind to that which is right before them, or saying, wait, have patience, we'll get to it, or we can't make a difference. Look at the crowds, not just only uh, in Miami and across America, across the world. They look like the United Nations. This young generation are, uh, it's a different bird. They're, 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 they're eagles. They're flying. They're not going to listen to that foolishness. They're going to insist that change be made. And so for that, I am very, very hopeful, and I, and I look forward to working with them. Secondly, I want to make sure that I say uh, to those who don't understand, and, and I, look, some people really don't. They haven't had the experience. I, I ask uh, law students to read two 
letters. I'm going to suggest three. One is by James Baldwin, letter from the region of my mind. Two is from Dr. Martin Luther King, the famous letter from the Birmingham jail. And three by uh, James Baldwin, letter for my sister, Miss Angela Davis. It is a fantastic distillation of what the history of and the present condition of Blacks in America. And so we have the responsibility to reach out and tell our story. So a, a person to me said, well, why are you saying Black Lives, Lives Matter? We say Black Lives Matter as much as White Lives, lives but you, you can't put that on a bumper sticker. That's too long for a bumper sticker. Just like you, federal, FedEx used to be called Federal Express, but it was too long. So they just said FedEx, OK? So real quickly, January 2014, which is a winter day in Fort Pierce. Great day because in, in South Florida, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. A 30-year-old black man is in his garage. He's playing his music. He's drinking his beer. A white woman drives by to pick up her children. She hears the music. She thinks it's too loud. She calls the police. Fort Pierce police come to investigate a, a music too loud. They knock on his garage door. He doesn't open. They bang on it. He opens. He sees it's the police. They don't have a warrant for his arrest. They don't have a warrant to search. He closes the door. What do they do? They shoot through the door four times, shot him in the head, killed him. They didn't know he was killed because of the other side of the door. Other people came. They firebombed the house. They threw in gas. They tore the house up. They got in the garage. They found out he was, he was dead. They said, well, he pulled a gun on me. Well, they found a gun. He was in his home, in his back pocket. Everybody knows if you had a gun pointed and you got shot in the head, you didn't have time to put it in your back pocket. So it was obvious a lie. There were no charges filed against the police officer. There was no administrative action taken against the police officer. So the family went to court. They heard this evidence, and the jury came back and said, we will give for the $11,000 the mother paid for the funeral, we'll give her $1. For the three children, who lost their father, pain, suffering, the fact that he can't counsel them, be with them when they graduate, walking down the aisle of marriage. They said, we will give each of them $1 a piece. The jury then went on to add salt, pour salt in the world and say, because the cop shot you through your door at your house, you are 99% resp responsible for the cop killing you. So we're going to reduce the $4 to a penny a piece. So the mother got a penny, and each of the dollars got a penny. Black lives matter. Last point I want to make. Everybody's talking about looting, 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 looting. In 2008, the, the banks looted the treasury of, my, of, 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 of the United States of America, collapsed our financial system, and collapsed the, the financial system of the world. Not one person went to jail. Wells Fargo created $200 million worth of false accounts. Nobody went to jail. 2014 to 2016, $40 billion was not raised because the highest bracket of taxpayers never filed tax returns. To this day, nobody went to jail. And let me close with these words from someone that whites who don't like civil rights listen to. You know, they didn't listen to Martin Luther King when Malcolm was alive. You know, they had a choice. This is what, this is what Mike, uh, Martin Luther King said. Urban riots are mainly intended to shock the white community. This is Martin Luther King. They are a distorted form of social protest. Even looting is an act of catharsis, a form of shocking the white community by abusing property rights. And here's the most important sentence. Quote, if a soul is left in darkness, as Artie Shepherd has told us, sins will be committed. The guilty one is not he who commits the sin, but he who causes the darkness. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Smith, and I want to let our uh, panelists and our audience know, for the panelists who can stay, I'm being asked by uh, the university powers that be to continue our discussion for the next uh, 15 to 30 minutes, if you all can do that. 
and also for our university audience that the specific questions we're receiving about the university's role and what uh, we're going to do moving forward will be addressed at the uh, town hall with the president on Friday. That having been said, uh, uh, Dr. Blanford, this and my time in the community in the last couple of days, uh, so many people in this outrage while uh, Mr. Floyd and his death was the fireworks that set this off, go beyond the law enforcement. And even with COVID-19, those of our genetics suffering the highest uh, percentage rates. Uh, and I explained to an individual the other day that, hey, look, you know, we're just with the COVID-19. We have jobs that have to be in the public and public contact more often. We've lost more jobs. The economic opportunities, the lack of medical care and health care. Uh, to me, so much of what has happened is uh, really a manifestation of all of that and this contact with the police department and the callousness of it that we saw ignited this. Can you address that, that a lot of this uh, has to do with many other factors and a combination of factors, not just contact with the police department? Uh, definitely. I was actually maybe, a, I don't know, I think maybe Today's Wednesday, I'm, I'm trying to get my days together. So this is maybe on, on Monday. I was sitting and, I, and, I'm, and I'm thinking back, like you said, about this just, there being this culmination of, of just everything that's going on. So you have, of course, the situation with George Floyd. For those that could, I started watching and I literally could not finish the, the video. I, I turned it off and I, was still having dreams and I wasn't able to sleep and I didn't even watch the whole thing. But you have that going on. And in addition to that, like you said, you have the situation with COVID-19. You have that Blacks are more likely to be victims and they're more likely to die as a result of COVID-19. And to that point, I will even say the fact that many Black people knew that and still went out and risked literally their health. And I don't even mean just in the sense of perhaps coming against uh, an overzealous officer. But the fact that they were even saying, you know what? Yeah, I understand we may be more susceptible. We, we, our rates of victimization for COVID-19 are higher. We're going to stand out and we're going, to, we're going to walk for what we believe in. But then you also, as you said, you have that those people that are being exposed to COVID, a lot of times work maybe they're essential workers, right? So you have a lot, of, a lot of Blacks that are essential workers. So either they're forced to go to work and perhaps expose themselves, or let's say, I know we have a large population here in South Florida of um, Blacks that work in the hotel industry, right? So we have a lot of them that perhaps may not have any income coming in. So it's, 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 it's multiple things that are happening all at once and it seems to be disproportionately affecting black america and so i think definitely it's a culmination of what occurred regarding other cases with police brutality but also just everything else that has gone on in the last year and just everything that we as black americans experience on a day-to-day -day basis and i don't think anyone that's on this um, this panel because I've seen several people in the in the group, group chats um, address looting. I don't think any of us is condoning, nor do we believe that the person that is stealing the large screen TV or Jordans from the shoe store or toilet paper from tissue are, are necessarily acting in the name of, of of justice or George Floyd. But it's it's just a culmination of of everything that we've had to endure for so long. And I understand that some people may not get it. I understand for some people, it's not their reality. But what I do believe is that each and every single one of us, we can be empathetic and we can try to understand and try to put ourselves in those person's shoes that perhaps we don't own or we don't walk in. And when you, when you think in those terms, oh gosh, so this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. I think you're able to better contextualize this historical moment. 
Ms. Shepard, uh, what have you and uh, the other members of your union discussed in terms of uh, transitioning this and this energy? It is an election year into, as Professor Smith said, the things that need to be done long-term for uh, systematic change. So one of our missions um, with BSU is to educate our students. We want them to be informed. We want them to have all of the information that they need to then go out and make the change that they want to see. So starting from there, just providing them resources with how to better understand the legal system and what the criminal justice system looks like, what um, they should expect even in terms of just trying to, if they're going down the road, if they're driving um, in their car, what, you know, what is something that they can do if they, if they feel like a police officer might pull them over? All of these things. So educating them first is number one. But then as far as the university is concerned, one's having the open dialogue and conversation with administration um, and with faculty and staff members of what needs to change. From there, creating an actionable plan of how we're going to see that change effect how we're going to better help and represent our Black students that are um, at FIU, how we're going to serve the Black community that includes Black students along with Black faculty and staff that's at FIU. So that way, at least when they come to FIU, they can feel comfortable and secure and safe. If we start there, then hopefully that it causes a chain, um, you know, a chain reaction to the Miami-Dade community where they can start to feel more safe and open and secure with having police officers as one of their um, as one of their allies and not something to be feared. Uh, Captain Moss, how does a citizen handle a situation uh, such as what we saw with Mr. Floyd? And um, I was at an event the other day where there were police chiefs and a resident asked that question: What should an average citizen do? And I thought about that, and you know me a long time. At some point, I think that I would have ended up uh, being held. Uh, and called uh, Professor Smith to come bond me out uh, uh, on a battery charge against the law enforcement officer, which you know is not in me, but I don't think I could have stood there after a certain point. What can a person, civilian, do? Well, you know, in, in a situation like Mr. Floyd, uh, you know, that's just one of those situations where it, it's impossible to tell you what you should do. Um, because he, I mean, he was in an impossible situation. Uh, but what I, what I do say is this, you know, when I'm out at the barbershop, when I'm at the grocery store, people recognize me as a police officer. They recognize me uh, from being in this community for a long time. And they're always talking to me about situations that have occurred. And my first question to them is, did you, did you report the situation? And they'll say, well, no, I, I didn't report the situation. One of the reasons, ah, these things happen all the time. And having been uh, the, the, a police chief, uh, faced with situations where I've had police officers that I suspected were uh, involved in, 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 in things that prob they, sh they probably shouldn't. Uh, when I'm making that decision to remove them from police service, uh, one of the things I, I often need, especially with you know, having to deal with unions and all of these other things, is I need the ammunition to do that. And so I would always say to these young men, uh, if you didn't feel comfortable uh, going to the police to report that, there are other avenues to 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 report the, these 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 situations. You know, there is you know the Justice Department. There are uh, local groups uh, that are involved in this, but these things need to be documented and reported because as a being a police chief sitting in sitting at home in the middle of the night saying, "I got this guy. I can feel it in my bones. I'm not sure what it is and everything else, and I don't have the the, the things that create the due process to get rid of him. I need that ammunition because." As police chiefs, uh, as police leaders, we don't want situations like the one that just occurred. We don't want people on our police department that make it impossible for us as leaders to sleep at night uh, working, working on the streets. And so when I talk about being intentional and participation, part of that means, uh, means you know, filing complaints and reporting these, these incidents. And again, if you don't feel comfortable going to your local police department, in Miami you have the Civilian Investigative Panel. Uh, in Ferguson, we created a similar panel uh, to be able to address, address those things. Uh, you have your local chapter of the NAACP, you've got uh, the ACLU, you have all these groups 
that are out there whose job it is really to make sure that we're being held accountable for what we do. And so what I always say is if you're your brother's keeper, I know it's a, a scary, daunting process. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrifying thing, but you've got you've to gotta give us that ammunition that we need uh, to get rid of them. I mean, in some cases, we, you know, you know, we see it ourselves, we can. But when we don't have that whole thing uh, laid before us, it's, re it's really difficult. But when I start to get multiple citizens coming from different walks of life who don't know each other, and they're telling me the same thing about a police officer, I see that pattern. I can get rid of him. Oh. Professor Vincent Robinson, in your area of expertise, uh, you know, a lot of times we focus on the situation with um, African-American males and specifically, uh, you know, uh, young African-American males. But we've seen uh, two African-American females killed inside their own homes and also the impact of um, our African-American women uh, incarcerated uh, and the impact that has across the board on child care communities. Uh, and that also being a, a major issue that needs to be addressed. Can you please discuss that? Um, obviously, the criminal justice system is unfortunately uh, created in a way that people of color, uh, male or female, are, are subject to um, longer prison sentences. Well, first overall to uh, heighten charges and then they're more likely to be convicted and then they are subject to these longer prison sentences. Um, with women in particular, we're, we're dealing with a situation where Blacks often are raised in female-headed households, especially in, in today's generation. And when women are gone, when women are incarcerated or they're killed, we see the, the, family, the family structure falls onto other, other women within, within the family, within the family union, whether it's the grandmother or an aunt, there's somebody else who has to, has to step in. But we are dealing with children growing up without their parents male and female, and the, the problems that come along with that. So when, when these parents are gone, um, when they're killed, you have young people who are looking to the streets for, for how do I grow up? What do I do? What are my responsibilities? You are, you're looking at young people who learn from the streets what is or isn't appropriate behavior, who learn what society expects of them without the love and the shelter and the nurturing of that parent to help guide, guide their path um, in life. And the children are the ones who are suffering the most. And they are angry and they retaliate and they, they engage in behaviors that affect them in the school system. We see it in terms of um, behavioral, behavioral issues. We see it in terms of school suspension, school expulsions. All of those things are coming from losing a parent whether it's to death or to crime. Um, and and the, the consequences are, are long-term, they are long-lasting. They are not things that simply go away with a few counseling sessions, with um, a, a child having to accept that this is just the way that the world is, because it doesn't have to be this way. If we don't want it to be this way, there are programs that for the children whose parents are incarcerated, there, there are very few around the country, but there are programs that allow children to come into, into facilities. There are programs where there are nurseries for, for babies, but is, is that what we want? Is that how you want a child to be raised? And what else are you exposing those children to by allowing them to be raised in, in those types of um, environments? These, these aren't simple questions. These aren't... Um, these, these, how do I put this? They're not simple questions and, and they don't have simple answers at all. It's going to require a collective, a collaborative effort of many, many people to come together and figure out what we can and can't do to help women and children and anyone who is um, dealing with the criminal justice system. Uh, HT, I know one of your missions uh, is inclusion and diversity. Uh, as an example, the case uh, in Georgia not long ago, the same data that the uh, local police authorities and prosecutor had concerning uh, the two gentlemen who were eventually uh, taken into custody, one of whom used to work in the state attorney's office there, uh, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigations within 48 hours took them into custody. 
what can we do so that uh, people who uh, have a more diverse background are able to be in positions to make those kinds of decisions? And I know that's something close to your heart. HT, I'll unmute your mic there. Okay, you're back. One of the uh, you things I have... want to say is that I am a very strong supporter of the police. Uh, I am a very fierce opponent of bad police, of racist police, of police that dishonor their badge, of police who dishonor their mission to serve and protect. I proudly represented the Public Safety Department which was the prior name of the Miami-Dade Police Department. I proudly represented the Miami Police Benevolent Association, which was a black police union that had to be formed because they were not initially allowed to be a part of the white police. I have police clients to this day. So I don't want to get it twisted that I'm anti-police. When my house was broken in, I did not call the Black Lawyers Association. I did not call the NACP. I called the police. And they did a very good job. But when we give that much responsibility to people, we have to give them that much scrutiny. They need to be held to a high standard. When they can take your freedom at a moment's notice and take your life, we've got to watch them like a hawk. And, and by the way, good police don't mind that. Okay. Captain Moss doesn't mind that. Uh, he's going to do things right. He's going to not stand around and, and watch other people do things wrong. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I, want, I don't want you to get it twisted. I'm not in favor of looting or rioting. All I'm saying is those of you who have been screaming at the top of your voice about the poor people looting, I'd like for you to scream at the top of your voice for the millionaires and billionaires that loot all the time. Way, but they get more than sneakers. They're looting for billions and billions of dollars while you are asleep. And the politicians who facilitate the theft of your money, and it, you, it's like we're tranquilized, and we don't say anything about that. But we want to put everybody in jail who steals a pair of sneakers. You're going to do that? Fine. Let's get some of these bankers who who steal, who stole the money, were found guilty, but nobody went to jail. So now with regard to your question, here is, here's a big problem. More emphasis needs to be placed on vetting those who come into the police department. If a person is a racist, a black racist, white racist, a person who's just a bigot, you can train them, they can be the greatest police in the world, but they have so much discretion, they can use their bias to infringe upon your rights to hurt you, and sometimes even to kill you. More efforts need to be made in vetting who comes in. Secondly, more in terms of training. You see, in the black community, you know, someone says something to you, you say something back. Well, the police department, they talk, take control of the situation. You gotta say something back. You know, he's gonna get punched or shot or beat or something. It's that understanding, it's the cult, what we call it, cultural competence. You see, for black people, we're culturally competent because we have to work in the white community. We live in the black community among black family, black friends. We work and deal in the white community. So we call, we can operate in both. A lot of white people are, are, are if they, they live in the white community, they work in the black community. They go to white church. You know what I mean? They, 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 when they have parties, everybody there is white. And so they're not culturally competent. So when they deal with Black people, they get a wrong reading. Now, God said, "Hey, man, why you why why are you uh, bothering me? You know, why why, why are you why are you grabbing me? You know, they, this is it's just a question. It's like a white person says, uh, man, I know why you arrested me. Lice and smoke. That's just and so there's a problem. So that's number two. Number three, there's got to be civilian oversight. You cannot look. When you give people guns and they can kill people. You got to have a civilian watching, just like we do with the military." The President of the United States don't know more about the military than the military does, but they need to be in, over them. And so police officers say, we can't have civilians over us because they don't know about police work. There's got to be civilian oversight. The problem in Georgia was that the person 
who did the killing, who was a ring leader, worked for the police, for the uh, prosecutor's office. That should have been an immediate recusal. So what did they do? They investigated the case. They had the video. They cleared him. And after clearing him, they then said, oh, I have to recuse myself. Well, it's too late now. You've, rec you, you've cleared him. What else we need to do? We need to make sure that with regard to discipline, their people know. In other words, I'm coming in contact with a police officer every day. I need to know he's got 12 complaints for abusing people. There needs to be a registry, just like there is with doctors. When doctors uh, uh, cause damage to their patients, there's a record of it. So I know I'm about to get a heart operation. This guy has had complaints on three prior heart operations. <coughs> I don't think I'm going to use him. But if I don't know, I have a problem. So with regard to that type of diversity, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Willard, that you're talking about, one of the problems is racism has really made people believe that blacks are being hired solely for diversity. You know say, well, I, people tell me all the time, can you help me find a competent black lawyer? We competent? Well, hell yeah. I mean, you don't, I've never heard anybody say, can you help me find a competent white lawyer? Of course they're competent. I've been a lawyer 47 years. Half of that time I've been listed in the black best lawyers in America. No white law firm has ever offered me a job. They've offered a job to white lawyers that I train. They offered me a white a job, offered job to white lawyers that I work with. They offered uh, jobs to white lawyers that I taught. Now, if I can't get an offer for a job, can you imagine what, you know, I, I tell lawyers all the time, we'll know when there's when there's fairness, when a when an average black lawyer can get a job. Because average white lawyers get a job. You gotta be Thurgood Marshall or Constance Baker Motley to get a job in these firms. So this is all this is a part of black lawyers, black lives matter. So whether it's housing, education, healthcare, criminal justice, and finance, we are getting we're not being treated as if our lives matter. So doctors don't give when we say we're in pain, doctors won't give us a prescription as fast as give a white person. So we want to buy a house. They said, no, we'll give you money for a car because it's a depreciating asset. They redline our community. When we need to, uh, uh, money to open a business, we got to go to the government. Everybody else go to the bank. Why we got to go to the government? Those are the kind of problems that our white friends, we need to calmly and dispassionately explain to our white friends. There are millions of white people who are ready, willing, and able to join the army to finally slay the beast of white supremacy and white domination. That's why it was very dangerous what uh, uh, President uh, uh, Trump said. He knew what he was saying. That we need to dominate the streets. Because when blacks were brought here as slaves, the first papers, if you read the first papers, it says they were brought here because for a lust of domination. So he knew what he was doing. He's going to act like, oh, I didn't know that. That word, domination, that's why they were here. And for 250 years, all of us on this panel, white people owned us like pigs, hogs, ponies, and muskets for two, th 13 generations. And so that mindset that we are equal is hard for a lot of people to get their, get their brains around. But this generation, Artis, Shepherd, your generation, is, I, in my judgment, is going to say enough is enough, and we're going to change this for once and for all. And then we will, the Declaration of Independence says, all people are created equal. It never intended us, but they brought us over here. We're part of America. I went to the war for America. I found out that I love America, but America didn't love me. Our key shepherds of the world are going to make America love me back. Okay. Professor, uh, we're about to wrap up. I want to give uh, 30 seconds to each of you uh, for your final thoughts uh, as uh, we move forward. Dr. Blanford. Call me off guard there. There you go. <laughs> um, well, if I were to give kind of a final thought or wrap up, it would just be that, you know, as I previously stated, that each of us, those who may not understand what Blacks may encounter or 
may not have understood privilege, so to speak, to be empathetic. And for each one of us, no matter our walk of life, we can do something. And I think that that's important, whether you are a student, whether you are a faculty member, where you, your administration, whether you are in policing, wherever we are, we can all do something. And I think that if we, we, we kind of have that mindset, then things will get better. And then what that means is whatever particular sphere we're working in, we do our best to spark change. So for me personally, that means making sure that my students, because I teach criminal justice courses, right? So I, I, I actually interact with students that are planning to become officers. It's that I take that extra time. We have those uncomfortable conversations. And so that I do my job to make sure that they're prepared to go out and be law abiding citizens and to be excellent civil servants. Ms. Shepard. Um, yes, to Professor Blanford's point, just starting with education, starting with um, understanding the information that we have all of the information. My job as BSU president is to be that voice for our students, um, for the black community that is at FIU. So with our first initiative of the People's Platform, we want to be able to have transparency between us as students and with administration, black faculty and staff, whoever is involved with the decisions that essentially um, will concern our education. That is what we want to do. So that is my job as president and the entire executive board of BSU will be there to facilitate any type of change that needs to happen on FIU's campus. So that way administration knows what we expect and um, they can also expect something from us as well. So that is, that is what we want to do. Captain Moss. I think one of the things that's critical in this is to continue to have uh, conversations. I think when we're talking to each other, we're not shouting at each other. And I think there are teaching, there are teachable moments in all of this. I know that a lot of friends of mine have reached out to me to say, you know what, I really don't understand your plight. I don't understand what it's like for you to help me out. And I think that's, that I think it's courageous of them to reach out to me for those conversation and conversations, and I think it's my responsibility to do that. On one other note is while we've been having these conversations, I've been seeing questions pop up about the LGBT community. And uh, there are a couple of students that asked, and so I suggest, uh, since we didn't get to address that, if you could reach out to me here, I'll, we'll, I'll see what we can do, what conversations we can have to kind of address your issues as well. Professor Vincent Robinson. Education is critical to addressing all of these injustices. And we need to continue to look for opportunities for emotional development. We need to look for or try to develop relationships with people who are culturally and racially diverse. We need to confront our biases, whether they are explicit or implicit, and help others to confront the ones that they possess as well. We need others to join our rally, to join our cry. We need to have a uniform voice so that we can work together towards changing the America that we love into the America that it needs to be. And uh, the president is back with us, um, President Rosenberg. Well, I wanna thank everybody. I've been here for every word and I really appreciate the approaches that are taken by uh, our faculty, uh, our student, uh, Artrice uh, and uh, Captain Moss. Uh, get, it, it has obviously uh, been the result of a lot of contemplation and thinking. One name that I didn't hear, Willard, uh, throughout the conversation that I want to mention is Arthur McDuffie. And the fact that uh, Arthur McDuffie, who was an FIU student and a graduate of FIU, perished in very, very similar circumstances uh, that uh, Mr. Floyd perished in. And um, I was around then. Uh, it was a very difficult moment for us because in fact, one of the involved uh, uh, officers had been at FIU, not as an officer, but as a student. And I often wonder what we could have done better to ensure that Mr. McDuffie uh, got a better got a, got better treatment than he got, and so uh, here we are today, ha having practically the same conversation. And from my viewpoint, we've got to do a lot better. And 
uh, listening to uh, 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 Professor Vincent and Professor uh, Ams Blanford, you know, motivates me in particular to work with uh, our entire community to figure out specific things that we can do to arrest this 400 years. Uh, we can do more than our fair share. There's no doubt in my mind that we can. And uh, to challenge our community uh, to be mindful of the point that it is very true. This takes constant pressure. And I know that, that, that I, uh, together with our leadership group at FIU, are up to that. And uh, we want to work with you, Willard, and the entire community of concerned people to figure out how we never have to be back here again with the same kind of conversation. Uh, we will continue the conversation on Friday at 3. Uh, I hope everybody can continue with us. At that conversation, uh, we, I will be presenting uh, a number of initiatives that I believe can be taken as it relates to police, as it relates to the federal level, uh, as it relates to our community, as it relates to uh, education in general, and as it relates to our FIU. So we got to get on with this. Uh, and uh, I'm willing to work with everybody to put that constant pressure on to make the changes that we need so that we never have to have this, this kind of a conversation again. So I want to thank you, Willard, uh, for being a part of our, our community and our family. And I want to thank all of our speakers and those who uh, uh, had the thoughtful questions, maybe didn't get them all answered. We're going to look at them and see if we could uh, lean in on, uh, on Friday and what will ultimately be not just a continuing dialogue, but a continuing set of actions, very transparent, to make the changes that we all want so that we can live in a better world. So thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, thank you all for joining us. And again, um, the president will be with you on Friday at 3, three o'clock. Uh, we appreciate uh, all the input. We've been uh, overrun with the number of people who have participated, which is a, a good and a great thing. And the best to uh, all of you. And uh, FIU will continue to uh, lead in our community in all directions. And have a good night.